So who am I? My name is Aaron Jones, and I work here at the Chandler Police Department. I am an employee of the Chandler Police Department, but I am not representing the Chandler Police Department. Uh, I am also a member of the Phoenix Linux Users Group. In addition to that, I have a master's degree in intelligence analysis. Uh, I've been working in law enforcement and in military for close to a decade now, uh, if not a little bit more than. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I talk regularly. I do this cybersecurity meetup. A lot of you have been seeing me for more than a year now, and I thank you for all the regular faces that I see here in the crowd. So what are we doing today? Performance objectives. Well, at the conclusion of this course, you, before you leave, will be able to identify what Tor is, identify one reason why you may wish to use Tor, you're going to be able to explain how Tor works, and in addition to that, you're going to be able to explain how Tor began. What are the, the, the very beginnings of Tor? But before we get into that, we need to talk about a few things that are very, very important right now. The first one's going to be FOSTA, which is the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. Has everybody heard of this? Yes, a few of you. A few of you have not. That's okay. We will explain it. So, as per usual, the very first link that if you go to this and you open up the FOSTA bill, it will take you to congress.gov and you can read exactly what is in it. Okay, you can head over to this webpage, you can pull up this bill, and you can find out all the words that are inside of it. You can find out what actions have been taken. Uh, you can find out all the co-sponsors, the committees that are in relation to this bill. Uh, so House Energy and Commerce and then House Judiciary. And then we can also see related bills, which is very, very important here because many of these bills, in order to get around some of the, the, the people who were upset about them, they went ahead and just pushed it off into the budget. And we'll see that here in a little bit as well. So this right here essentially kills Craigslist personal ads, has everybody seen that? Craigslist no longer has their like adult personal ads anymore. They just went ahead and took those off. Uh, in addition to that, can anybody give me the name of another place that is no longer online? They just got seized. I can think of it, but I can't name it. Backpage. Back, back, yep, back page. Back page. So back page is completely gone. They've been seized. If you try to go to the back page webpage, it actually comes up with one of those really nifty like FBI seizure pictures with all the emblems and everything on it. Uh, now, for those of you who are wondering, FOSTA didn't pass before back page went down. Okay, so keep that in mind. FOSTA hadn't become law yet before they took down back page. Therefore, anybody who tells you that back pages down because of FOSTA, that's not true. They were able to take them down without using FOSTA. However, FOSTA is going to be a part of this case. Okay. So what is it in relation to? Well, the thing that they're worried about is any web page that's promoting prostitution or sex trafficking can now be held responsible for the content within. This is a really, really big change for over all the years that we have had the ability to say and do pretty much anything that we want on a web page without somebody being held responsible for it. This is a massive change for this, okay? Now, I'm gonna tell you right now, this is going to be selectively enforced. There's a whole bunch of people who have gotten up and said, well, this is gonna stop me from being able to uh, warn people about different practices that are uh, involved in sex trafficking and so on and so forth. Uh, this is targeting people like the owner of Backpage. Now, let me explain what happened with Backpage and why they're in so much trouble and why the owner of Backpage is actually being charged with pimping, okay? That's the actual charge that he got picked up for was pimping. Well, one of them, yes, but it's the main one. The, the main one that they're gonna try to get him, I think, on 20 years for is pimping. Um, so he creates Backpage and he has a section which is the adults uh, advertisement section, and they were pulling in anywhere from 10 to hundreds of millions of dollars off of that section. Okay, depends on who you ask and who you're talking to. It's anywhere from the tens to the hundreds of millions of dollars that were being pulled in specifically from people who were advertising for sexual, uh, I'm going to use the word stuff, okay, sexual things. 
business, yes, sex-related businesses. So FBI agents created accounts, they purchased advertising, they contacted him, and they made it clear multiple times, hi, my name's so-and-so, I'm a victim of sex trafficking, and I need to give you money so that I can post advertisements on your page so that I can sell my body or I'm going to be beaten by my pimp or so on and so forth. And the individuals accepted the money. And they became more and more blatant with what they were telling this person and saying um, things that could be uphold in court. Okay, so they could use this stuff in court. And eventually the FBI said, okay, they know that these people are being trafficked. They know that they're victims. They know that these things are occurring. And not only that, they're accepting money and they're facilitating. So people who are having issues with their accounts uh, and would admit, yes, I'm being trafficked, or yes, I'm a prostitute, or yes, so on and so forth, even though all of that was within the email, they were still providing support for them to make sure that their accounts functioned so that they could continue to become victims or be victimized. Uh, after all of this had occurred over several years, several investigations, so on and so forth, apparently now they finally have enough evidence that it started to stick. So as soon as the guy got back, I believe from Denmark, they went ahead and executed arrests, they ser uh, served search warrants, they captured servers, so on and so forth, uh, picked all this stuff up, and now the guy is facing 20 years with the main charge being pimping. Many of them who have been arrested right now are already pleading out. So they've already said, you know what, we'll just plead guilty, just we'll take lesser sentences. Now, some news outlets are claiming that if you're LGBT, this is going to unfairly target you in particular or uh, any number of other things that they're saying. I don't like the fact that they're passing this law. I don't like the law. Everybody knows kind of how I am about this stuff. However, you can't facilitate pimping, drugs, narcotics, any of these things from your home. You can't facilitate them from the newspaper. There's an endless supply of places where you can do these things that they will investigate you. Uh, your web page is no different. And it's not like this is setting any kind of new precedent either. I mean, they went after what? The Silk Road? So the Silk Road existed. That was a place where people were buying and selling drugs. And in addition to that, uh, any number of other services, including prostitution, well, they were investigated and that place was shut down. So this isn't different, but I think the fact that this is a little bit more high profile and a little bit more open, having been on the open net for so long, this is becoming a much bigger deal. Now on here, there is a link to a television show called The Computer Chronicles, which this was recorded in about 1980 something, uh, 1985, 1986, right around in there, where they're discussing things like BBSs and modems. And now, if you were to click on this, it will take you to YouTube and it will take you to the direct part of the show where they talk about a BBS owner sitting there right next to an assistant district attorney and they're arguing whether or not that BBS owner is responsible for what's posted on his BBS. Now people were posting child pornography on his BBS, people were posting advertisements for uh, prostitution, they were posting all kinds of things that we would be familiar with today, all the way back then on this guy's dial-up BBS, and here's the district attorney arguing that he should be held responsible for it. Well, he sits there and argues that he should not be held responsible for it. Now for many years, uh, it was very common for people to not be held responsible. That was sort of uh, upheld, but always argued. And so this is not a new argument. Nothing here that we're discussing within this bill and nothing that's happening here isn't something that hasn't happened all the way back in the beginning of time, okay? So the question is, should an administrator be held responsible for the discussions held on their boards? Is your BBS or your webpage like a newspaper with First Amendment rights, or is it like a utility that is subject to regulation? Those questions were posed then, and now they're posed today. 
However, the laws are turning against those of us who administer web pages, those of us who administer uh, BBSs. I still run a BBS. So uh, I don't get a lot of traffic, but potentially somebody could get on there and say something terrible or bad or whatever, and maybe I could get in trouble for it. I want you all to do a little research, find out what's going on with these things, and also look at the historical arguments that were posed, and just try to, to find out for yourself which way we should be headed. Uh, obviously, I'm a big free speech proponent. I'm real big on, uh, you know, don't punish the masses, punish the criminal, so on and so forth. Like, we shouldn't all be held responsible for the, the, the bad works of a very small few. But everybody here needs to figure out that this is not a new argument. This is something that's been going on for a long time, and it's finally coming to fruition for those of, who want to take away your ability to say things that you want to be able to say online. Next one is the Cloud Act, and this one's real important because this has to do with Microsoft and some of the stuff that's going on with them right now. Uh, Microsoft has been in court for a very, very long while, and what they've been in court for is they have stated very clearly that uh, if you have data and it is on Microsoft servers, well, it is a possibility that that data could be held in a foreign country. And if it is, they can't give it to US law enforcement. They can't give it to uh, intelligence agencies over here. They can't give that information to us. I'm going to use the word us uh, because of the fact that it's held over there and it's not beholden to our laws. So this Cloud Act, which again, if you click on it, takes you right to congress.gov and you can read it so you all can see. I want to make sure that everybody knows that don't just take my word for it. Make sure that you're going out and you're reading all this stuff so that you can better understand it. They went ahead and just put that in the budget. Instead of having to sit there and vote on it and do all of that stuff, they added it to the budget. It got passed. The budget went through. So now we're under the Cloud Act. Uh, there was a lawsuit between the government and Microsoft in which the government said, hey, Microsoft, you have to give us that data. And Microsoft said, no, we don't. And well, now the court, within a few days of the Cloud Act passing, went ahead and just dropped that case and said, oh, we don't have to have this case anymore because guess what? The Cloud Act says you have to give up that data. All right. Now, I have sat down and I have spoken to members of law enforcement who are on both sides of the fence on this. Okay? I have talked to investigators who work on child pornography cases who investigate these kind of crimes that by having had this pass, they expect several cases to go from being open to closed and, and solved very, very quickly because this has changed. Okay? However, this is a loophole. This is a loophole that was created that bypasses all of our rights and protections for our data and our privacy to be able to hand it off. Okay? So now, when the government goes to Microsoft and says, uh, give us your information on such and such person, well, now Microsoft has to pony up. Uh, they can't just say, well, that information is held in a foreign country or it's overseas or so on and so forth. In addition to that, we will now be able to work openly with foreign intelligence services. Before, the idea of working with a foreign intelligence service to be able to gather information and data from overseas and bring it into the U.S., or to gather information on US citizens was considered sort of this foreign, like, oh, this is so weird, like, we don't do this. And I'll show you evidence of that further down. I have some videos for you all to watch uh, where they discuss this uh, in relation to the Lockerbie bombing. Now, the Lockerbie bombing is kind of old, like, it's, it's from a long time ago. Some of us will remember Lockerbie, some of us will not. But one of the big scandals was that uh, after the Lockerbie bombing, British intelligence gave information on people who were doing Freedom of Information Act requests to US intelligence and allowed them to investigate. Okay? So we made a deal that Britain would give us information on people who were doing their own uh, lookups on what was going on, and we would investigate them and then pass that information back to British intelligence. Huge scandal. It was a big deal. That, after this Cloud Act, no longer a problem, okay? 
So now law enforcement can open cases and pursue prosecution based on data provided by foreign services legally. So I mentioned the Trump dossier in here, whereas it was a considered a uh, uh, sort of a scandal that, oh, we received information from this foreign intelligence agency who passed US intelligence information on a US citizen, and this is a big problem, and so on and so forth, and they started an investigation about it. Well, now, after this, that's no longer an issue for them to be able to do that. So, foreign agencies can now provide us information on US citizens, and we can use that for investigations. That's the, that's the, the, the end of it right there. And again, I give you a link so that you can see Microsoft, they're in court right now. Uh, the Department of Justice has already asked the Supreme Court to drop the Microsoft case. It's already been dropped. There's a ton of information here. You really ought to take the time to look into this stuff because it's very, very important. And it's relevant to our uses of Freenet, of I2P, and Tor. Okay? Because this is what's happening on what amounts to the clear net, the open net. And if we're investigating these tool sets that are supposed to keep us private and to not allow people to track what we're doing online, what we're saying, or how we're behaving, uh, it's only a matter of time before they start using this to be able to investigate servers all over. And we'll get to that a little bit further. One more thing that I want to leave you with before we get into tour proper is going to be protest fatigue. So SOPA, FOSTA, Cloud, <coughs> and you'll see that I was working on this before Cloud passed because I do mention that Cloud is an inevitability. We will lose on the Cloud bill, like it's going to happen. There was no huge outrage, no you know, massive turnout from Reddit, from 8chan, from all the different web pages that are supposed to come together and tell everybody like, oh, we should be fighting Cloud. Well, they've spent tons and tons of money on just SOPA. They did all the advertising, they did the, the digital sit-ins, they did all of these things, and you start hitting into protest fatigue. Because somebody can take that bill and they can keep refiling it with a different name until people are so tired, they just can't fight it anymore. So we have this endless number of bills that are each running back to back, working towards trying to take away your rights, to remove your ability to have a private conversation, uh, and we're running out of money, we're running out of attention, and we're running out of outrage. People get beat down. It just, it happens. And we're losing these battles. So network neutrality, that's a loss. We lost that. FOSTA will be a loss. It is now. That now, right now it is a loss. But at the time I was writing this, I knew it was an inevitability. And then we will lose on the cloud bill. Well, guess what? We did. They just moved it into the House Appropriations Bill became part of spending, and it passed. So what do we do next? I'm going to leave that to you all. Think about it. What can we do? Can you stay outraged? Can you stay mad forever? Can we keep fighting it? I don't know. I'd like to think so, that there will always be somebody who gets up and decides to spend their Thursday night either sitting down and listening to this stuff or getting up and talking about it, but I don't know. So let's get to the tour project. Questions to the end, man. Write it down. We're going to have a couple Senate seats to uh, fill in the next couple of years, so uh, you might want to think about having an impact early in the primary season. Thanks. Was that like a I should run for Congress kind of thing? Run for Senate? <laughs> I'm, I'm not recommending one way or the other. I'm just noticing that the, the, there are perhaps people already planning to do that. Good. So this is Tor, and this is the Tor webpage. Tor is pretty popular, and most people already know about Tor, but we're not going to just talk about the, the outer shell of Tor. We're going to get into some of the more nitty-gritty parts. Now, Tor likes to tout that they protect your privacy, uh, they can help you defend yourself against network surveillance, and uh, they help stop traffic analysis, which in some ways they do, and in general, the use of Tor can provide some levels of protection. I'm going to interrupt that thought right now. 
uh, story time on what happens if you use Tor, but nobody else is using it. So out here, college, nameless, not going to name the college, uh, it was time for finals, and everybody had to go do their testing. So one of the gentlemen who had gone for finals decided to sit down and jump on the internet using Tor and send a message through one of those uh, text-to-speech deaf phone call systems and said, uh, I've got a bomb planted, it's going to blow up in the school, blah, 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 everybody's going to die, I'm going to set this whole place on fire, send, using Tor. And then as soon as he was done with that, he flipped Tor off. Okay? Now, for those of you who are in the audience, can anybody tell me what his biggest mistake was? Flip it, flip this result. Time frame. The end, getting out of it. Time frame. So, he didn't have Tor on, and then he turned it on, he did his business, and then he turned it off. So now he set a timestamp. There's an empty spot, kind of like taking scissors and cutting it out of that little time space, and there's a great big old empty spot. So the school, of course, being scared, picks up the phone, calls in the FBI, calls in the SWAT team, calls in everybody, and says, we just got this huge threat. This is a terrible thing. Everybody's going to die. So everybody rolls out with all their equipment and their gear, shows up, immediately looks at the logs, and they see from, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock, you know, 10.02 a.m., there's this small chunk of time in which somebody was on tour, and he was the only tour user on the entire network. He was the only person that was there during that small period of time, and he had called in a threat. But they didn't see the threat part, so what do they do? They go, they knock on the door, the guy opens up the door, and they say, we know that you called in the threat, we know it's you, blah, blah, blah. Was it you? And he immediately breaks down. Yeah, it was me. I called it in. I didn't want to take my finals. I was scared I wasn't, wasn't going to pass. So he immediately admitted to what he did because A, he had done it. B, he was scared of all the people with guns and body armor and stuff that showed up at his door. And C, he had left a giant trail of breadcrumbs for everybody to follow right back to his dorm room. Tor can provide you some levels of privacy. Tor does not make you invincible. Freenet doesn't make you invincible, okay? In addition to that, I2P does not make you invincible. You can use any of these tools, but you will always leave, now there's an M word here, metadata. Now we've talked about metadata in here before when I've talked about some of the intelligence analysis stuff that we do, but there's that data that isn't the core data, it's that supporting and surrounding data that you can still use to build the picture. It's kind of like having a jigsaw puzzle with some of the pieces in the middle pulled out, but there's still enough information for you to be able to figure out what that picture is. Does that make sense? You can build the frame, but you don't have to have, you know, the picture of Cassius Clay's face to know, oh, that's Muhammad Ali right there, but you can see that pose. Okay. So they allege, and I use the term allege not in a negative context. I use it just like any other law enforcement related person would use. They allege that they provide protection to journalists, activists, business people, the military, and others. Okay? Tor encrypts their traffic and bundles it through a method known as onion routing before passing on this bundle of information between nodes on the way to the destination. Now, big difference here, we talked about garlic routing with I2P, right? And now we're talking about onion routing here. The idea being with garlic routing, you have several different layers of communication for several different people, whereas with onion routing, that communication is only for one sole user. So you have one onion, but with garlic routing, you can carry the information for multiple users. Therefore, it is supposed to make it more difficult for somebody to be able to track back the traffic when doing garlic routing over doing onion routing. So you can use Tor to communicate internally to the Tor network itself with dot .onion sites. They would all be internal to the system. Or you can use the power of an exit node to access information found on the ClearNet. Everybody understands the concept behind a ClearNet? ClearNet being just any web page that's out on the internet that is not part of the Tor network, the Freenet, or uh, I2P, okay? So Google.com, that's ClearNet. 
Now, Tor recommends the use of their Tor browser. And that's a tool developed with a base in the Firefox web browser that is recommended for ease of access and use. Oh boy, we're gonna get into Firefox here. And y'all know that I have a real low opinion of Firefox. So I do not trust Firefox and I do not trust the Tor browser. That's me. Here is a small list of vulnerabilities for Firefox, okay? We're looking at approximately 190 current vulnerabilities right here. Uh, tons and tons over 7.5 in terms of, you know, how dangerous they are. CVE is a great place to go to start doing research before you start to do anything in terms of penetration testing, learning about different software, anything like that. Go find out what the giants have done and then go stand on their shoulders. And this is where you can do that. People are doing the penetration testing for you and now you can go back and you can look and find out, you know, what kind of vulnerabilities are there? What versions are affected? What kinds of things are people finding? In addition to that, just for those of you who don't have that mindset, keep in mind that just because they claim that one of these CVEs have been resolved or fixed doesn't necessarily mean that they have not created a new vulnerability. And sometimes it pays to go back and look at something that they have claimed to have fixed in order to locate new problems. Because they can implement something to fix an issue that then opens up brand new holes. So keep that in mind, okay? So, tons and tons of active exploits, tons and tons of problems, tons of issues, okay? Tools like the Tor browser will continue to be vulnerable, full stop, no matter what. I don't care what browser you pick, I don't care what system you're using, if you're connected to the internet, you're making a hole somewhere, all right? Now, in fairness, everybody knows that I love e-links. e-links is my, that's my buddy right there. I use eLinks all day and I use eLinks with uh, Freenet. So I'm gonna throw up, we got some CVEs for, free, uh, for uh, eLinks, all seven of them, all seven vulnerabilities that are found inside of eLinks. I put them up there. So if you guys wanna break into eLinks, please do, because I'd love to find out if there are any more problems so we can get those problems fixed. Have you ever used eLinks? Yes. I use Lynx for uh, Gopher. So Lynx comes pre-built with Gopher protocol, whereas eLynx you have to build from source to get Gopher protocol. So I use uh, Lynx specifically for Gopher. Everybody know what Gopher is? No? A little bit? Okay. So Gopher protocol, I'm just gonna, we'll segue into Gopher protocol real quick because that's my favorite thing in the whole wide world. Gopher protocol was the protocol that existed before HTTP. So before you could go to the web, they had Gopher protocol, and every single Gopher web page looks essentially the same, and it's easily surfed with your number keys, because you can simply go to link one, link two, link three, so on and so forth. Where HTTP one out was on the ability to track users, the ability to uh, transfer information between the browser and the user, and then back to the server and back and forth. Gopher is not really built like that. Gopher is sort of a one-way track of information. I have information on my server. You want it, you can pull it down off of my server. It's much more secure because you can't push. You can't push to my server. Uh, now, there are ways to push to Gopher, especially nowadays. They've sort of made that a little bit easier, but uh, I also don't like that either. Your browser and we've talked about this before and we'll talk about it again. Your browser sucks. My browser sucks. Everybody's browser sucks. There's tons of problems. Can anybody here tell me, starts with a J, what is the worst part of modern day browsers? JavaScript. JavaScript. Most of your vulnerabilities that you're gonna find in Firefox in the Tor browser and in some of the vulnerabilities that we'll talk about down below, JavaScript. It's somebody using JavaScript to be able to attack the browser and then from there de-anonymize the user. Now, and we'll talk about this again in a little bit, but Firefox, or I'm sorry, the Tor browser does not disable JavaScript by default, which is what has caught up a lot of people. 
A lot of people surf web pages and they go to these web pages and their JavaScript is turned on and they get popped. So that's essentially your number one vulnerability here. And I'm going to be fair here and I'm going to tell you that's not Tor's fault. Okay, the Tor protocol is fairly sound. When you're attacking a system by targeting the web browser, that is completely different than targeting the system because you're able to actually attack the protocol. Everybody understand what I'm saying there? So I'm not saying that Tor is a, a bad system in and of itself or that the Tor protocol is bad or anything like that. It's the supporting software that surrounds Tor that I disagree with and I have a problem with. So, GitHub, it is. Well, this is actually GitWeb. So this is where Tor does their development and you can come here and you can start viewing the Tor commits. You can see what code is being written. You can see who's committing to it. I've told you all this before. I'll tell you all again. If you're going to use software like this, please review the source code. If no more than to go and look at who is developing on it and get a feel for who actually pushes code because that could be the difference between you identifying somebody doing something malicious with the system or not knowing who's working on the system. Familiarize yourself with the coders at the bare minimum. Even if you can't read the code itself yet, it's also good practice so you can start familiarizing yourself with it. Especially for those of you who are my students, uh, start learning to familiarize yourself with other people's code because guess what, when you get out into the real world, a lot of what you'll be doing is supporting other people's code. They also have a GitHub, so you can head there. Uh, some of it is active, some of it is not. So they have GitHub, I've added links there, you can head there as well. Next thing that you're wanna, going to want to do is get yourself the installer. It's totally a million different ways of doing it. Uh, if you're on Ubuntu, they have some PPAs. They do warn you if you're using Ubuntu or Debian not to use the Tor that is made available uh, directly within the repositories that are stock. You need to add their PPAs because those stock ones are usually behind. They're uh, uh, several versions behind. If you're using something like Manjaro or Arch, uh, you, can get, uh, you can get Tor through Yaourt. So that's an, a really easy way of doing it. And then once you've done that, you can open it and then open the Tor browser. Super simple, super easy. In addition to that, I'd like to give you two alternatives. Both of these use Docker. So you can either proxy all of your content through Docker and send it through Privoxy, uh, which is one way of doing it. And then another group has a way of doing it so that you can send it through their own uh, proxy and using uh, IP tables. And then in addition to that, uh, you can always just run the browser natively. Now, everybody knows that like with Freenet and I2P, I run those on a server that has nothing to do with my house. I push those out to a foreign server and then I connect to that foreign server just to move my traffic outside of my computer and normally I do it through SSH tunnels. Now you can see how I do that in previous talks on I2P and in uh, Freenet. So if you would like to do that, you can do that also with Tor. You can set up a Docker machine overseas you can set up the Provoxy and then you can use an SSH tunnel to move all your traffic from here out to that system and then push it up into Tor and then out into the internet if you were interested in doing that. Uh, I don't install these things on a local machine. I just don't. I don't keep them on a local machine. I keep them off site and I keep them in a foreign country because it's just one more step. Now obviously those steps are getting much shorter and much smaller and much easier to surmount. Cloud Act right, FOSTA, all these different things. So those steps that I had created are getting much, much smaller. But it's one more thing that you can add because it's a language barrier. Pick France. How many people do you know speak French? Some, 
but it's one more layer. And also, there's a ton of people in France who speak English because I actually work with those guys pretty regularly out in France on server stuff, and their English is great. So that's also not a barrier. Does the European uh, privacy rules uh, help? It's a good question because we don't know yet. So for those of you who don't know, Europe has a very, very strict set of privacy laws, uh, both within the European Union and then within Germany and then like Britain. All of these different groups have very, very, very strict privacy laws, extremely strict, uh, to the point where several companies, including like Apple and others, are being sued for tens of trillions of billions of dollars that are undoubtedly going to be reduced into some kind of manageable fund for that company that would be incredibly a giant windfall for us if we were to ever get that money. But going off of that, uh, here I'm going to give you a prediction that may or may not come to fruition, but what I think that we're going to eventually have is country segregated servers to where if you live in China, all of your servers will be in China and you will be, be beholden to Chinese law and you won't be able to use servers outside of China. If you're in the European Union, same. And if you are in the United States, same. I think eventually we will move to the point that because of the vast differences in laws, that they're going to just decide one day, Americans have to stay with Americans, Europeans with Europeans, because we can't meet in the middle on these privacy laws. And that's how that's going to end up functioning. And I'm thinking that's probably going to end up happening within five to 10 years, just on account of the fact that our Anti-privacy stuff is so divergent from the way that things are in Europe. The amount of fines that people like Microsoft and Apple are going to get popped with for mistakes that they're going to make, it's not going to be worth it. It'll be a better idea for them to just keep things separate. In addition to that, if you don't know this, but Apple is moving a whole ton of servers into China in order to meet their laws right now. So for Apple to be able to do business in China, they've moved the servers into China and given the SSH keys and all the security keys to the Chinese so that they can go through that server whenever they want. So keep that in mind. So back to Tor. If you are a Tor user and you're using Tor from your home, the FBI has you on a watch list for real rails, not for play plays. Like that's not me just saying words. They actually have a watch list that will pop up eventually and your ISP will report you and they will say, hey, this person is using Tor from their home and then eventually they'll put you on a list of people that they need to keep an eye on. No different than if you were a member of Linux Journal and you owned a copy of Linux Journal, well, guess what? You were on an FBI watch list and that's in their documentation that was leaked by Edward Snowden and all of them. So we have, we have the paperwork that says that they're doing this. Here's a news article on it from the register they can issue a warrant to monitor you, to monitor your traffic, to tap your phone lines, to do whatever it is that they want to do if you're using Tor. Okay? Tor is an indicator. Tor exists as an indicator of criminal activity. Bar none. Okay? That's it. If you're using Tor and you're using it from your house, you're being watched. Guess what? I'm probably on a ton of lists, like a whole ton of lists. Because I've been doing I2P and Freenet and Tor and I've been writing all this stuff and investigating all kinds of things and typing crazy stuff into Google and DuckDuckGo and all these different places all day. I am shocked that somebody hasn't come and knocked on my door yet. But I guess we'll see. How do they justify probable cause? So funny you would ask because that's the actual text right there. Yeah, I can actually read this to you though. So authority to issue a warrant. At the request of a federal law enforcement officer or an attorney for the government, a magistrate judge with authority in any district where activities related to a crime may have occurred, guess what? Crimes occur every day, okay? So anywhere crime may have occurred has authority to issue a warrant to use remote access to search electronic storage media and to seize or copy electronically stored information located within or outside that district. If the district where the media or information is located has been concealed through technological means, TOR, I2P, Freenet, okay, or in an investigation of a violation of their code, 
The media are protected computers that have been damaged without authorization and are located in five or more districts. So if you've got a cloud and somebody breaks into your cloud, well now the FBI can go break into your cloud too to go start an investigation. If you are using Tor, they are authorized to ask for a warrant and then break into your home computer. Okay? And there's the text right there. There's, there's a breakdown of what they can do. Now, sadly, we can't watch videos here. I would love to be able to play this video for you. I'm going to leave it here for you all to be able to watch, though. Uh, I really recommend watching this video. Come to the web page, click on it. It's about 11 minutes, maybe 16 minutes. But it is about a couple in Seattle who get harassed by the police for running a tour exit node. Now, let's discuss this. And I really wish I could show you the video because it really, really bothers me. I have a lot of problems with what they're saying. So this couple, they uh, run a tour exit node in their home in Seattle. They're part of like a privacy group. And uh, from that tour exit node, they just allow anybody to go out to the internet. Okay, not the brightest of ideas to do it from your home, but they decide to do that. Now, this was early on in the days of Tor, so law enforcement wasn't familiar with what was going on with Tor yet. I'm just, I can just tell you that right now. Your average cop was not familiar at that time with Tor. Now, we have training now where they talk about Tor for beat officers. So our beat officers can sit down and learn about Tor. I've taught some of this training, okay? So it's different today, but at the time that this video was made, these officers were working off of a very, very simple premise. Somebody was surfing child pornography, okay? An officer, finding out that this person is surfing child pornography, asks for an IP address for the connection, gets an IP address, tra tracks that IP address back to this home, and there are a ton of servers that are being run in this home, and somebody is accessing child pornography off of the IP address that is assigned to this home. So they do a, uh, now they're saying that this was a no knock, but then later on in the thing, they said that they announced themselves, so I'm not sure which one it was. But in general, with child pornography and things like that, they will kick in your door and enter the home because we have had multiple instances of people who realizing that they are being raided will kill their wife, kill their kids, and then kill themselves. So it turns into a great big old suicide bloodbath in the middle of the house if they don't get in there and stop everything as quickly as they possibly can. Okay? That has occurred. So that is one of the reasons why when they raided this house, they kicked in the door. So they, boom, into the house, and they start seizing computers, gathering people up, making sure nobody has any weapons, so on and so forth. Now, of course, this family probably not knowing any of this stuff, they decided to tell the media that they were being harassed for running tour. No, somebody tracked child pornography back to the IP that's at your home and then entered the home dynamically in order to make sure that you or whoever it is there doesn't end up slitting the throats of all of the family members in the house in order to clear the place out before officers can arrest them, okay? In addition to that, of course, the officers checked the home. They discovered that there was no child pornography within the home. And so guess what? They did not seize any of the computers. Now, they could have, but they did not. They left the computers there. They did their search, found out what was going on, talked to the couple, and then exited. That went a lot better for them than situations like this have gone for other people. Okay, we just talked about in December the guy who got shot uh, in Oklahoma. They got, he got swatted, and they just shot him on his front yard. So while the negative publicity that comes from their actions of going in to investigate the, the child pornography incident that's going on in this home, uh, I'm a little biased, but I think that all things considered, and at the time that this occurred, things went better than could have been expected. I recommend that you watch it and get your own opinion. 
So when we discuss TOR and the manner in which many of these individuals complain about the harassment that they're experiencing due, due to their participation as an exit router, we need to look at the laws concerning accomplice liability, and you should also read more about accomplice law. Now this is important because this is going to come up eventually. Like, I'm telling you guys things that's going to happen within a few years. Is everybody familiar with the idea behind accomplice liability? No? So you're going to hear about this in the news fairly shortly because it's starting to become a hot ticket item in terms of this is the next thing. Uh, everybody was really, really pissed off about search and seizure and then for asset forfeiture. Everybody remember that? You get in trouble and you got $30,000 in your car. Well, you got in trouble and you had money, so they just take your money. That's asset forfeiture. So the new thing is accomplice liability. And what this is is if you assist somebody in a crime and do not actively attempt to stop them, you are just as guilty as they are. Example, I will give you an example. Uh, I jump in my car and I go and I show up at your house and I say, hey man, jump in the car with me. We gotta go to 7-Eleven. And so you get in the car with me and we go to 7-Eleven. And as we're walking in, you look over and I'm pulling a mask down over my face and pulling out the Mac 10 and we walk into that 7-Eleven and you thought that we were gonna buy beer, but instead I stick the guy up and I tell you, grab the cash, and so you grab the cash, and as we're walking out, boom, I blow away the guy who's running the cash register, we jump in the car and we run. Well, when the police shows up and they finally arrest us or whatever happens, uh, you, for being part of that crime, are guilty for murder, I am guilty for murder, and if there was anybody else in the car who helped keep the engine run, running, that person would be guilty for murder as well. That's accomplice liability. That's the act of being an accomplice to a crime and being responsible 100% for that crime. How about car owned by a girlfriend who was at work at the time? Uh, that's going to be between you and the lawyer, man, because I've seen some pretty, um, some pretty shaky accomplice liability prosecution. And it's stuff that, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I wouldn't have brought that forward, but other people have, and sometimes it comes down to, do you have enough money to defend yourself? So that it could be used as leverage against her? All ki yeah, all kinds of stuff could be, yeah, sure. Uh, there's actually an example in here for the complicity, uh, complicity and the accomplice law. There is actually an example of what happens if I come to you and I tell you I'm going to commit a crime, and then you tell me not to, or what if you tell me to do it, and then later send me a letter that says don't do it. There's all kinds of like examples of these crimes being uh, prosecuted. So I would definitely look into it. So what does this have to do with Tor? Well, if you're running an exit node, are you an accomplice to somebody being able to gather child pornography, to buy drugs, to purchase heroin? What if they die? So you're running the tour exit node that somebody used to go out and buy heroin. That person goes, gets home, shoots up, they overdose and die, and then eventually they are able to track back that purchase all the way to you. Should you be responsible for that? Now, I think not, but with FOSTA and the Cloud Act and everything else that's coming through, it would not be a large leap to be able to say, this person who is running an exit node should be responsible for what's going through their network because they were an accomplice in that person being able to commit that crime. They used your internet, they used your bandwidth, they used your server, and not only that, you had to set that server up so you put in work to make sure that that exit node worked. That's a really, like, it's a really shitty argument, right? I see some faces out here who are like, well, I, I don't want to hear that. But that's where we're moving towards. Would okay. that make like someone goes to the library and logs on there? Good question, because we're going to get to that as well, because that actually is going on within the Tor uh, network. They're actually setting up exit nodes at libraries. And there's a big fight about that as well. So we're going to get to that. So guess what? Tor, I'm going to check the time. I'm sorry, our clock isn't working. 810, okay. So Tor is used to commit crimes. It just is. It is. Guess what? Freenet is too. The open net 
is used to commit crimes. Cars, planes, trains, even banjos have been used by criminals or became instruments in crimes. And we don't try to ban them, spy on people for owning them, or worry that our neighbors may be serial pumpernickelers. So, in 1988, a murder was committed in Britain in which a man was beaten to death with bread. Somebody took some pumpernickel and beat this dude to death with the bread. Okay? Was he the baker? No, and he wasn't. He wasn't. And it wasn't in the parlor. Yeah, I got a chuckle out of it. Thanks. Poor guy. <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. Uh, so privacy is a fearful thing. And those who wish to retain, retain their right to privacy are considered strange, scary, weird, all kinds of things. I like privacy. I should have a right to be private. The things that I give you on the internet, that's my right to give you those things. But if I don't want to give them to you, I shouldn't have to. That's, that's how I feel. However, when law enforcement is investigating a crime and they trace that criminal activity to your home, they will want to better understand why your home is being used for criminal behavior. If I follow somebody to your house because they're buying crack at your house and I find out that your house is a crack house, I'm going to want to investigate that. But what is the difference between if I follow digital data to your home and find out that your house is being used to distribute crack digitally, well, am I going to investigate that? Sure. Providing an exit note and advertising that your home is used to traffic child pornography drugs, anything else is going to grab law enforcement attention. It's just, it's going to happen. Those privacy advocates who provide exit nodes do so at the risk of their traffic being marked as hostile or as a carrier of illegal traffic. They're making a sacrifice to put this stuff up online or to give you an opportunity to be able to have access to an exit node, but to the flip side of that, they're also putting themselves in a vulnerable, vulnerable position where they're open for investigation. So I'm going to give you my word of advice here, do not run an exit node from your home, and if you do decide to run an exit node on a server owned by a hosting company, make sure you pick a company that understands what you are doing and how to handle law enforcement requests for information. You do not want to go to DigitalOcean and set up a copy of a Tor exit node and then just sit there quietly. You need to make sure that the company that you're hosting your Tor exit node with knows that when Law enforcement sends a letter to them, they need to have a pre-built letter that says this is a Tor exit node, you will not find illegal content on this server, so on and so forth, here's everything. If you need more information, contact us. There are letters that the FBI gets all the time that says this is a Tor exit node, okay? You need to start doing that so that you can take a little heat off so that somebody doesn't come run up on you while you're in a restaurant and put cuffs on you and put your face in the dirty floor at Denny's, okay? Because that happens. So how do we set this up? Set your security to high, disable JavaScript with no whitelists. Some people like to whitelist JavaScript sites. Do not do that. You don't want to have any place where JavaScript is turned on. And you also need to make sure that your Tor is running somewhere where it is, ha where it is at or is close to 24-7 uptime. Because what are we doing? Every time your Tor machine turns off, we're just snipping the ribbon. And we're, we're giving them some kind of um, evidence through metadata. If it runs 24-7, that's much harder to be able to say when you were using it. But if you only turn it on when you're using it, it's much easier to say, well, they were using it at this time, and I got some server records over here that show that a Tor user was connected at the exact same time. I can one-to-one -one this. And that's good enough for a warrant that goes further. Change of state fingerprinting. Yes. Yep. However, let's ask, who made Tor? Who really actually made Tor? Does anybody know? Hard mode? Don't read the, don't read the thing yet? <laughs> Correct. So Tor was originally developed as a method for the United States government to provide bi-directional communications over the internet where the source and destination are hidden from view. They needed it for spies. Okay. We have agents within non-permissive environments, foreign countries, and they needed to be able to communicate back to the United States without their traffic being monitored. So that's, that's how it started. The Department of Defense, Naval Intelligence, and DARPA deployed TOR in order to protect their assets and to hide their activities. It was never intended as a tool 
for dissidents or as a tool to protect users from government spying. It was never, okay? Just never, ever, ever intended for that use. It was created to facilitate spying while using the noise produced by others to mask their behavior. The more people who use it, the more hidden you are. You're building more weeds. So you, as a user of Tor, are a smoke screen for all the other stuff that Tor is being used for. But you get the added benefit of using Tor. Now, Tor is not shy about revealing their military applications for their tool on their site. Who uses Tor? Hey, there's the military right there. They talk about it. You surf down far enough within their webpage, you can find out who's really using Tor. <coughs> Excuse me. So, Tor is, first and foremost, a military and U.S. government oriented tool and provides benefits such as anonymous communication to the public as a side effect of that mission. That is not the actual mission of the tool. But, you might be asking, why would you think that? Like, maybe the military just uses it sometimes, or maybe it's just we get the benefits, but the military gets the side effects, right? Could be the other way around. Well, let's talk about their financials. So if we go to their financials, we can pull up the Tor financial reports, and they're kind of behind. Their 2017 stuff should have already been out by now, but it, for whatever reason, it's not out, so I'm not sure what's going on with that. Bless you. But you can see who is paying them, how much they're being paid, where the donations are coming from, and where they're spending money on different aspects of the project. Uh, there's a thing called a Form 990. Look for those. Whenever you're interested in a project that touts that they're a nonprofit, find their 990 financial forms. Read it. it tells you a ton of information about the project. Okay. Now, some believe that Tor is funded by the U.S. government. Got another link for you with more to back this up. And I want to make sure everybody knows, for everything that I say, I'm linking directly to different news articles in different places. Now, this guy, I hate when they do this because this is good information, but it's really, really, um, what's the word? I'm going to use the word provocative. Like, they make it sound like an extremely terrible thing that they're supported by the U.S. government and that a ton of money comes in from the government. And when I say a ton of money, I mean millions, okay? Uh, 6.1 million just from the BBG, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so they make this very, very provocative, and he talks about how, like, he feels betrayed because they're not a grassroots organization. They're, removing, they're receiving money from the government. That doesn't matter. In the grand scheme of things, as far as the product is concerned, the fact that they receive money from the government, that's not a, that shouldn't stop you from using it because it's still a, an effective tool that provides what it provides. But you need to understand that some of the things that are touted are not the things that it provides. If you know what this tool does for you, then it's fine. But don't use it for something that it wasn't intended for. Okay, so the BBG, which is the American Propaganda Company, I just mentioned it, but I'm going to do it again. They provided about $6.1 million to Tor. Okay, so $6.1 million comes from the BBG. Is everybody familiar with the BBG? No? So uh, anybody ever heard of something called... Um, Free Radio America, America Free Radio, places like that. Uh, Free Asia Radio, no? Okay. So in foreign nations, in countries overseas, we have a uh, stated mission of bringing freedom to these countries. We bring them information about democracy. We bring them different information about uh, news articles and things like that that we feel are important. Now, most of what the BBG targets is going to be Southwest Asia. Uh, you're looking at Egypt, uh, some African nations, uh, in addition to that, places like Iraq, Iran, 
all those countries. And if you go to the BBG Twitter, which you can, most of it's going to be targeting those nations. Okay, so a lot of it really doesn't apply to us, so I'm not surprised that we within this room wouldn't really know what they're doing because most of it consists of doing things like America's awesome because we have clean water and if you want clean water, you should be a friend of America. And then they show pictures of like people drinking clean, clean water. Or they'll say something like, uh, if you want to be able to go to college, America has the best colleges in the world. You should come to America to, to go to college, but in addition to that, you should be pro-American. They have these very blatant uh, propaganda-ish messages that they put out. Yes? It's similar to what the BBC does, only really kitsch. Kind of, yeah. So, in addition to that, I tried to look up, there's a group called Rise Up, and Rise Up is really, really in tight with Tor, and uh, they kind of support each other, but I couldn't find any of the financial information for Rise Up, so if you do have it, or a link to it, if you could pull, do a pull request and give me that inside this talk, I would appreciate it. Or if anybody's watching this, that'd be awesome, because I searched for several hours and could not find it. Uh, because I wanted to take each one of these groups that are providing money and other forms of support and put it all in there. But some of them, even though they are nonprofits, I couldn't find their financial data, which seemed weird to me. Obviously, it's gotta be somewhere for them to link it to the government so they don't get in trouble, but I couldn't find it. Being supported by the government and getting your money from the government should tell you two things. They have contacts within the government and they can get things done. And B, somebody cares enough to make sure that they're well funded. Uh, and if you can also look at the programmers. So you know how I told you to look at the GitHub and then look at the programmers? Some of those programmers are paid and you can see how much they're getting paid. And I think everybody on the list, uh, as far as I could see in their actual uh, financial statement, Everybody there is well over six figures. So another thing to keep in mind. They're, they're making a ton of money off of this. So what is Tor supposed to do? It enhances your privacy and gives some level of identity protection. Everybody get that? Enhances privacy, some levels of protection. It's very important. Does not make you invisible. Does not make you invincible does not do any of these things. It is a supplement. And also, it is a supplement to good operational security and just smart behavior. This thing is not gonna save you when you're the Dread Pirate Roberts and you decide to get on Stack Overflow and post, hey guys, I run the Silk Road and it's a kick-ass place to buy heroin and dope and hookers. And in addition to that, does anybody know how to fix this really basic Apache problem? Uh, also, here's my email. Right, not gonna help you. That's the reason why the FBI got that guy. That was the Silk Road owner, Dread Pirate Roberts. Essentially, they tracked him all the way back to posts he made on Stack Overflow, followed those, and then went and arrested the guy after pretending to have a lover's quarrel in front of him and that he watched like a moron. And uh, so they stole his laptop. There you go, 50 yard overview for what happened with that guy. No tools can provide absolute protection to the user, none. There's nothing online that you can do that's gonna give you 100% protection, okay? This, this being Tor, is not a tool that you can trust perfectly to make you anonymous, hidden, or invisible. Reiterating, okay? Remember, the Tor system relies on a fork of Firefox, your local software or proxy, and an internet connection. All of these things make you vulnerable. In addition to that, even being air-gapped, there are ways to get into your system when it is air-gapped. Uh, is everybody familiar with the new proof of concept where they infect your system with malware and then they set up a small piece of hardware that sits there and listens to your power line and they're able to essentially send data through the power line by making your processor spin up and then down, causing a drain on the power line and therefore they're able to capture data from an infected system just over your power cord. Okay, so. Run a UPS. <laughs> right. Now this is a fun thing right here. This is, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about something that's fun. This video right here, 
uh, is Mark Thomas's Secret Maps of Britain. Again, this is an old video. It's about 46 minutes long. When you have time, watch this. All the things that we've been talking about over the past year are actually in this, except as conspiracy theories. So it's really fun to see them talking about these things as sort of like the British Alex Jones getting really wild and angry about the fact that, did you know they could turn off your cell phone or your telephone during a national emergency? But we now know that as SOP 303. So we know that that was a plan that we've had for many, many years, a standard operating procedure 303. In the event of an emergency, we're shutting your shit down. Like, you're off. You're getting offline. But here, all the way back in the day, that was a rumor. That was a scary thing. Like, what if they did that? What are we going to do? Uh, I really, really recommend watching this video. It's fantastic. Uh, they also talk about sharing data between spying agencies. Uh, they talk about editing maps to hide information, kind of like how Google Maps does that, and that was a big conspiracy just a couple of years ago because there was places that are on Google Map that are the Google Map redacted. Well, guess what? They've been redacting maps forever. Yeah, it, it's a long-standing map maker's tradition to redact items and also insert false items as a way of knowing if you copied it. Uh huh. So let's get back to Tor, because that's a that's a fun video that I wish I could watch with all of you. But uh, doing okay on time. Yeah. Setting up servers is hard. I'm gonna click on this just to, to show you all. If you're using Apache with default settings, it can unmask your Tor hidden server. Okay? Setting up your server is hard. Just, it can be difficult. But it's going to become infinitely more difficult when you start adding an abstraction layer like Tor, worrying about the safety of your users, and incorporating a number of private and government users who all wish to cause you harm or to unmask you. Like, setting up your server is difficult, but as soon as you start adding people who are actively trying to hunt you down and figure out where your server is and screw you over, it becomes way harder, okay? People like Dread Pirate Roberts. We talked about it a few seconds ago. What happened? Didn't know how to work Apache. Was having issues with it. Kept allowing Apache to error out and then to present the real IP address for the Apache server to the users. Criminal mastermind, he was not. The thing that kept him going for as long as he went was the people he was up against were not server administrators. They were not super experts in computers. They were not Linux users. Okay, these were people who were entering a, what amounts to a new domain in law enforcement who sort of stumbled along, and again, the real reason they found him was because of his Stack Overflow posts. Not because somebody hacked into a server or they were able to use some magical zero day that they paid $1.7 million to some mystical hacker for. None of that. It wasn't a spy novel. It was somebody Googling to, that eventually brought this guy down. Uh, and let's not forget the internet backbone. I bring it up all the time. There's only a handful of companies that actually do all of the internet for the entire world. And all of them, I think, except for one, is beholden to the US. And so US government can sit at the internet backbone and essentially watch your traffic, and they know where all of the hidden services are. They know what is going on with your system. They can read your emails. They do all of that. That's where all that data is getting shoved right up into Utah. We have a giant Utah data center up there that takes all of our information and processes it. That's where that stuff is going. So we have the building, we have the ability, and in addition to that, if we click on the Internet Backbone link right here, if you all are interested in reading about it. There's about seven companies. Yep, there's about seven companies. It's called Tempura. Which is the one that is in under, which is the one that is grown? What do you mean, road? Not under US. Uh, oh, Russia has one that they're trying to do as well. 
Yeah, Russia has one, and I would suspect China has one, but mostly they just do, they just chill with their little great firewall. But uh, they are also monitor traffic, but most of it is internal to China, whereas Russia does a more global view. So anyways, this is Tempora. Go here, start reading about it, because this is exactly what I'm talking about. Hook up to the internet backbone, and then from there, you can sit there and figure out where everything is. So the reason they have to put it in Utah is because they've maxed out the power grid in Washington. Back, well, that and also one of the reasons why they sent it to Utah is because of the high LDS slash Mormon population there, and most of them can pass background check. And so you have this huge number of people who can pass background. I'm, I'm dead serious. They can, they can pass background there, and because they can pass background, that's a really huge pool of people that you can pull from. So that's one of the other reasons that they placed it there. So JavaScript provides many vulnerabilities as per usual. Okay, if you're using JavaScript, you're already vulnerable. It sucks, stop using JavaScript. If it was up to me and I was king for the day, I would go out and I would take JavaScript out of every single computer. We'd go back to Gopher and uh, I, I don't know, after that, I mean, everything else would be gravy. So now let's start talking about some significant incidents in Tor history. Tor has suffered a few scandals. Some of those scandals uh, more important than others and some of them better reported than others. Now, I'm gonna give you a link here. If you go to this link, that is a chat log. That is a chat log from the IRC dev chat room uh, that documents when an individual, and I'm gonna read this word for word because I don't wanna mess this up. This is one situation which occurred in which an individual who presented themselves as a State Department employee, and that's very important for those of you who have ever worked in the military or in law enforcement, when somebody tells you that they work for the State Department, they don't work for the State Department. Thank you. Achieved employment within the TOR project. They then later revealed they were a member of an American intelligence agency and had joined up with TOR in order to do some good while using false credentials. Okay, and what they said was that they essentially worked for uh, the State Department in a um, some sort of human resources type role, and that was their cover. They later claimed that the government had no knowledge of their clandestine personal operation to improve tour. Now, one tour member was so concerned by this deception and their own situation that they believed their family would be killed. All of that is in the chat logs. I recommend reading the chat logs. It took me about 35 minutes to 45 minutes, and I was sitting there surfing other web pages while I did it. But you should read the chat logs so that you can get a better understanding of the discussion that was made, okay? Now that individual uh, goes by MRPHS, and I'm not sure if that's an acronym for something, but his actual real name was Nima Fatimi, and I probably butchered that, and I apologize if you're watching this. And this is him right here on his Twitter. So this is the gentleman that this occurred with around the, the major part of the scandal is this guy right here. Oh, he's got a whole bunch of other pictures of his actual face. I wouldn't, I'm, I don't think he's worried about that. I don't think anybody's concerned about that. But uh, he's an Iranian who functioned as a contributor to the Tor project. He is still a functioning member of the Tor project, but when I say was, he was an Iranian. He's no longer an Iranian, I don't believe. So shortly after this chat occurred, he was immediately moved to the United States and began deploying Tor exit nodes inside of libraries. That's where we, so back to the libraries. So I'm gonna open this so you can see. I believe we have a full picture of him here. Nope, this is a different one. Sorry. So anyways, Tor opened up a project where they started deploying exit nodes within libraries. The reason being that by employing these exit nodes at the libraries, their thought process is this normalizes the act of running an exit node, and if people see criminal stuff happening, well, it's happening at a library, the government wouldn't shut that down, right? It, it begins the process of normalizing. Well, shortly after that happened, the government 
tracked child pornography back to the library and then shut it down. Uh, Homeland Security actually stepped in and said, we can't do this, we're shutting this down. Well, then that became an argument and people got pissed off. And so then, after a great big old fight and argument and a town hall meeting and so on and so forth, they brought it right back up. So we went from toward bad down, toward good up, and now I believe we are currently in the down cycle and they have brought those back down. Uh, as far as I could tell from the stuff that I was seeing, they were down again and I have not seen whether they're back up. So if anybody knows if they're back up, let me know. Was this Vermont? No, this is, I don't think so. I don't, I don't know. I don't think so though. So, yes. Even the libraries were held responsible for the content that was being pushed through them, but during the course of the investigation and everything being brought to light, once I realized what was actually going on, it turned into a little bit of an up and down, and I believe that whole part of the project has been dropped, and I don't know of anybody else who is now following that. Okay? I can picture the sysadmin looking and just saying, well, what do you want me to do? So, Tor is regularly used for hosting child pornography. Let's get it out of the way. All right, Playpen was run by the FBI. Child's, Pen, Child's Play was run by the Australian Police Department, okay? I want you all to keep this in mind. The world's biggest child pornography rings were run by the US government and the Australian government. And they were run on tour, and they were originally set up on tour, and they were seized, and they allowed them to continue to run while they unmasked users. And this, don't even get me started on this, because this gets me super pissed off, because guess what? Pretty much all of the convictions that happened on here were either overturned or dropped because of the fact that they didn't want to reveal how they did it. I can tell you how they did it. It was a JavaScript exploit, undoubtedly. But because they did not want to reveal this information, pretty much everybody that they busted while re-victimizing these children over and over and over again, uh, eventually they just had to let these guys go. And I've been super salty about this for a long time. Uh, but I'm, I don't work in the Fed, so I can't do anything about it. But I bring it to your all's attention so that at least you know about it. The governments are unmasking onion sites. They are taking them over and they are impersonating these sites. I do not know of any efforts to unmask the method used for capturing these sites or understanding the methodology used for defeating Tor. If they are looking into it, they are not doing it publicly. Freenet and I2P, both of them, when they are investigating their vulnerabilities, regularly investigate them publicly. All the information is available. I have shown you all where that information is available. I've showed you how to get to their GitHub so you can see the question and answers. Everything there, public, over here on the Tor side, them not addressing the fact that many of these sites are being taken over, I have reservations about that. That's a problem for me. I don't understand why these web pages are being knocked over and Tor is not addressing like the giant elephant in the room of, yes, we know that the government is running giant child pornography rings over the Tor network and we're going to figure out how they're doing it and why and take care of it. Or at least address it in some way. I don't know what's going on there. But that is another reason why I do not personally trust the Tor system, okay? What about content? We always go over content. Is there positive content? Well, Tor content includes all open net sites that do not explicitly block Tor use as well as many Onion-based sites. From there, I'm going to springboard into the idea. If you're going to use Tor, you should probably be a foreign national who is unable to surf the clear net and then use Tor for being able to gain access to public information. That's what Tor is good for. Tor is not good for us. Because here within the United States, it's obvious that they're able to unmask our traffic. They're obviously able to unmask the .onion sites. They're able to do all of these things. And in addition to that, it paints a giant bullseye on your back. So your use of Tor, probably not necessary. Now, if you were using something like Freenet or I2P, where 
those systems are a little bit more secure. And in addition to that, your dark nets are a little bit more secure. That would make more sense. But the, the, the dot onions and the Tor, I don't see those. In addition to that, the most well-known and notorious criminal-related sites rely on Tor due to the manner in which it provides a similar style of platform as the open net for conducting web-based business. What does that consist of? LAMP, right? Linux, some sort of web server, Apache or Nginx, and then your PHP, your SQL, and your JavaScript, all of those things combined. So you can run your .onion site, but you can run it just like a regular web page, and then the next thing you know, you're getting popped by the, the whoever it is that wants to gain access to your stuff anyways. So if you are a person who is genuinely concerned about um, your personal safety because you're sitting there talking about Falun Gong and you want people to know about that out in China and you're personally worried, hey, I could potentially be killed. Somebody could kick in the door and gun down my whole family because I'm talking about some religious stuff. Well... Tor is probably not going to be your first choice because of the fact that setting up the server is hard. Making sure that you stay secure is hard. Uh, not having the support of that group who is supposed to be sitting there and figuring out how these things are being unmasked so that you can still do your religious or otherwise stuff. Well, if you don't have that support, that's hard too. <coughs> Excuse me. So what? Most users are going to employ Tor for surfing clear net sites with enhanced security. However, over 1 million users log into Facebook using Tor. So my assumption is that many of these users live in non-permissive environments that do not allow a connection to Facebook. China. China, legally, you cannot connect to Facebook from China. So... I'm going to take a wild guess and say that those people who are trying to use Facebook over Tor have to be from Iran, uh, China, so on and so forth. But guess what? Facebook is an intelligence gathering device that we are providing to foreign nationals to give us our, their information, pictures, where they go, GPS coordinates, a treasure trove of information for an intelligence analysis person, and we provide that through Tor. Does that make more sense? on why those people have access to that stuff? Why that stuff would be made accessible? Okay, following me? No, it's just for the advertising. That's right. And also to keep batteries in Mark Zuckerberg's little wireless charger that he sits on. And a couple of you saw that picture. So, how about we answer the questions that we had above? What is Tor? Well, Tor is a peer-to-peer -peer platform that employs the use of a specific browser to function. That's essentially what it is. Users of Tor include doctors, educators, privacy advocates, drug addicts, seditionists, and criminals. Everybody from grandma on down can use Tor. Tor functions by allowing users to anonymously share files, browse, chat, and more through the use of the Tor protocol. That's all. If you can do it on the internet, you can probably do it through Tor. Tor uses onion routing while IOTP uses garlic routing, and Tor is more focused on accessing servers outside the Tor network while I2P and Freenet attempt to minimize connections to the clear net. If you need access to the clear net, you should probably be using Tor. If you need access to a dark net, you should probably be using something else. Again, I recommend Freenet. Love it. Love Freenet. So our conclusion is, this concludes our three-part deep dive into privacy-enhancing tools. I stand by my statement that I believe Freenet to be the best of the three that were reviewed. Tor provides an interesting tool set designed to provide some very specific protections, but due to the nature in which it is configured, the reliance on the Tor browser, and the historical as well as current issues we have found, I do not recommend this tool set. And I wish deeply that we could build an internet that was designed to be secure from the start. The current assortment of tools for securing us or providing us with privacy are bandages that hide a festering wound. The internet was not made to be secure or private, and we have moved far beyond the point of being able to resolve the issues with the current deployment of tools. It will be some time before we find a resolution for our problem, and I personally believe that we will not find a resolution for the specific issues that plague us. And when I say that, I mean that wholeheartedly with HTTP, HTTPS. That set of protocols and everything that is based off of that was never designed to be secure. 
and I do not believe that just sitting here and just adding bandages is ever going to secure it. We have to find a better way of doing business. So what are my final recommendations for you? I recommend that you register a PGP key. Be able to encrypt stuff, learn how to decrypt things and how to send signed messages, okay? Use Linux, obviously, always use Linux. ABC, right, always be clicking. Contribute to a privacy enhancing project. I recommend Freenet, but pick one. If you like Tor and Tor does what you're looking for, contribute to them, ask them. You know what I did? I went to their IRC channels and I said, hey, I'm making these videos, I'm doing these talks. I wanna give you an opportunity to review this stuff. You tell me if I'm wrong, and if I am factually incorrect, I will make changes, but I will not make any changes if it hurts your feelings. And guess what? Everybody said thanks. It's exactly what we want. I was given heaps of thanks because they couldn't believe that somebody was sitting at a police department who works for law enforcement sitting here talking about this stuff. They were pleasantly surprised. So even something as simple as writing up a little blurb and then talking about it in front of a group of people is enough to contribute. Find a way to contribute. Uh, develop relationships and build your own darknet. You need to network in the real world. You really have to. Nothing beats being able to sit down face to face and know somebody before you guys discuss things. Now some of it you can't do it again if you're the Falun Gong practitioner in China and potentially you're going to get your whole family machine gunned, I can totally understand you not wanting to meet up with a bunch of people and end up getting run over by a tank or something. That's fine. However, if at all possible, start building those relationships now so you have them. And of course, if you don't want to contribute to any of that other stuff, at least contribute to an open source project. Can't recommend it enough. Find something open source to contribute to and find a way to give back to the community. So I'm going to open up. We got about 10 minutes. Uh, questions? Anything that I didn't cover correctly? Anything like that? What can I help you all with? What's the easiest way to say, hey, I want to help you when contributing to an open source project? Uh, generally, if you go to their GitHub, you'll often find open issues, and good open source projects will often mark those as like beginner, intermediate, and hard, and you'll regularly see this on different projects. Take a look at their GitHub first, see if there's any open issues. If there are not any open issues, then find out if they have an IRC chat room. Go to their IRC chat room and just let them know, hey, I'm a student, I wanna learn about how to contribute to open source projects, can somebody give me something easy to start with? And I guarantee you, somebody will jump in there and say, I need somebody to do spell checking or to review this code and make sure that I've commented everything correctly or something, and they'll get you started. They're, it will be very rare when an open source project that is hungry for people will ever turn you away. Well, thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate it. Well, I'll be hanging out here for a few more minutes after this is done, but I can't thank you all enough for spending your Thursday evening coming out here and listening to me talk, and I hope it was a benefit to somebody here. So, thank you. Thanks.